Well, torture is not my favorite subject, uh, but it's one that uh, a lot of us and in veteran intelligence professionals for sanity have been spending a good bit of time on. It's uh, nothing that we thought we would be dealing with since it seemed to us that, that was, uh, torture was pretty much taken care of by international and national law after World War II. But uh, Mr. Former Vice President Never Tell a Lie Dick Cheney uh, says that it uh, works. Uh, the distinguished senator from South Carolina, I want to quote him exactly right here, uh, Lindsey Graham, uh, says that, uh, well, I'll, I'll paraphrase what he said. He said, well, now, I want to hear uh, the other side of the story here because uh, the vice president says that, that uh, we got good information from that. And lo and behold, uh, it wouldn't be around, uh, this kind of techniques wouldn't be around for 500 years if they didn't work. <laughs> you know, hat tip to the Inquisition. Then there was a army sergeant that spoke in Palo Alto uh, a couple of months ago, and I talked to him, and he said, uh, yeah, it works like a charm. You, you give me unbridled authority uh, to treat a detainee in any way I please, and I guarantee you that I can make him confess to not one, but two solo suicide bombings. <laughs> Maybe I'll just tell you uh, uh, in a more kind of graphic way what I think about um, the notion uh, that torture uh, is useful uh, in, in gaining reliable information. Uh, and let me draw from my Irish heritage here uh, for a story about these two nuns. They're coming back from the hospital where they worked in Northern Ireland in Belfast, and don't they run out of petrol halfway to the convent? Terrible situation. They looked under the bonnet, under the hood, and they found no gas can, but they did find a bedpan from the hospital. They said, well, that's better than nothing. So they, they took the bedpan down to the petrol station. Just before it closed, they, they get it back. And, they, and the one gun was, I don't know if you know about bedpans when they're pretty full. They're rather unwieldy. And this one nun is trying to contend with the bedpan. The other one was opening the gas cap and <laughs> screeches to a halt is the Reverend Ian Paisley, the hard right head of the Protestants in Northern Ireland. Now, he was in a fancy limousine, you know, the kind where you, you, you can push a button and the window goes down by itself. He looks out the window and sizes up the situation with this one nun balancing the gas, the, the gas, the bedpan there. And he says, sisters, I don't agree with your religion, but I do admire your faith. <laughs> now, faith-based intelligence or intelligence gained from torture is worth exactly what Ian Paisley thought was in that bedpan. <laughs> uh, if people ask you for testimony as to whether this kind of harsh interrogation, call it enhanced interrogation procedures or um, what the president called an alternative set of procedures for interrogation, call it whatever you will. If you want the answer to whether it works, well, I see no better authority than the head of Army Intelligence, uh, Lieutenant General John Kimmons. Now, this is a gutsy guy, because what he did on the same day he knew that President George W. Bush was going to advertise and extol the virtues of enhanced interrogation techniques and what he called an alternative set of procedures, on that very day, Kimmons called his own press conference right across the river, the Pentagon. What did Kimmons say? He said, no reliable intelligence has ever been gotten from harsh interrogation techniques. History shows that. And the empirical evidence of the last five years, comma, hard years, comma, also demonstrates that, period, end quote. 
Now, maybe it's not just because I was an Army intelligence officer way back when. I think it's more that the, uh, the credibility really is due to uh, John Kimmons and not to um, Dick Cheney, let's say, who had other priorities when, uh, when other people were going off to war, or to George Bush, who served uh, admirably, except when he didn't show up uh, for the Texas National Guard. Now, I, um, I know a little bit about the Bible. I've read it. Uh, I can't say I, I read it through twice, as uh, George Bush the Elder claimed his son had read. Uh, but I do I'm familiar with it, and uh, I've never had much truck with the demons, you know? I mean, it's a little embarrassing talking about the demons. But I'll tell you folks, I know what the demonic is now. I've seen, I've seen it up close by just reading the accounts that are available to each and every one of you, if you but take the trouble to get on the web and download them. I refer to four documents. The first one is the Senate Armed Services Committee report dated December 11th. That's the executive summary. That was made available in December, and the full text was made available in May, I believe. That's chapter and verse as to how torture was implemented in the military. It's a bipartisan report issued by Carl Levin and John McCain with no dissenting voices. It's the play-by-play -play on what happened. Worse still is the International Committee of the Red Cross report, which Mark Danner, who was here last night, was gutsy enough to publish. He couldn't publish it here. It was published in the London Review of Books. That is a gory description of what happened to the 14 so-called high-value detainees at Guantanamo, the ones that were brought there after the fall of 2006. Uh, the next one, uh, the next issue was the uh, four torture memos by the Department of Justice. These were released pursuant to an American Civil Liberties uh, FOIA uh, request. And uh, they hang out there on the ACLU website. And as I go around the country and ask people if they've read any of them, uh, usually there's a blank stare. No, I didn't know they were available. Well, how could you expect to be apprised of their availability by what I call the fawning corporate press? You know, caught no, caught no uh, publicity whatsoever. Maybe a little mention here and there. And the last one is the Inspector General's report dated May 7th. 2004 from the Inspector General of the CIA, which was issued in the heavily redacted form a couple of years ago, like 95% redacted. That means black. That means, you know, I have a hunch that the, uh, that the cartridge makers for our printers, that they have an in with the CIA because <laughs> it took me three cartridges to, to print out the new version, which is only 40% redacted. But when you have a whole page in black, that uses up your cartridge, okay? That, even though there's only 60% of that document, you really need to read it. Eric Holder is reliably reported to have said that it sickened him. And it was right after, and he read the, you know, the 100% of it. Um, and it was right after that, that he went to the president and said, look, you know, I'm supposed to be pursuing the facts and uh, uh, doing justice here. I'm going to have to, uh, you're going to have to widen the investigation that John Durham has embarked on and let me go after the folks that were uh, guilty of these heinous crimes. What heinous crimes? Nine-year-old boys. Uh, Sam Provence, who was a uh, systems administrator in Abu Ghraib, a good friend of mine now. Uh, he wasn't an interrogator, he wasn't an MP, he was the systems administrator. He kept the computers up, but he had the night shift, and so he saw the people brought in. He worked eight to eight, he was, saw the people brought in, and saw them dragged out, heard the screams, and was constantly asked to participate in these interrogations. And he's thankful to, the, to, to his dying day that he resisted that temptation. Um, those are just some of the, the examples I could go on. Scott Horton, some of you know Scott Horton, a very prominent uh, international civil rights lawyer. Um, 
and very well regarded on the Hill and elsewhere, uh, he was asked by legislators, uh, people in our Congress, who were preparing a bill to ban contractors from doing rape by instrumentality. Those of you who have read some of the things I just mentioned know what that's all about. Uh, they fought for this language so that the contractors in our employ would be banned from doing this, and the White House lawyers fought it tooth and nail. And Scott Horton couldn't believe it. And finally they said, well, what possible objection could you have for this? And they were silent. And then later on they said, well, there are very strict federal and state statutes against this, and uh, we don't want any people to be vulnerable uh, to prosecution uh, if we change this language, if we adopt this language. Um, I won't go into the gory details, but this Binyam Mohammed, who was released and is now in Britain, talks about what he suffered in terms of uh, actual uh, sexual assault with razor blades, and you can read that on Huffington Post. Uh, Naomi Wolf has an article on that just the last couple of days. And of course, this squares with what John Yu uh, responded when he was asked out in Notre Dame, I think, was uh, uh, would there be any legal reason to prevent the President of the United States from ordering uh, a young boy uh, to have his testicles crushed in front of his family? And you said, no, no, there's no law against that. Okay, so you carry it right through and you see the, the demonic. Uh, Carol Wickersham, who is one of the board people at uh, the National Religious Campaign Against Torture and also a Presbyterian minister, uh, she too uh, has imparted to, to people her shock and dismay and her new belief that the demonic happens to be all too real. Now, we call them enhanced interrogation techniques. We call them all manner of euphemisms. And I saw a startling use of euphemism on the front page of the Seattle Times this morning. Let me see if any of you noticed it. Uh, there was a little article about uh, uh, President Obama two weeks ago uh, going out to Dover, Delaware uh, to greet the incoming... Incoming... Okay, coffins, bodies. Anybody know the exact words used? Pardon? Say again? Remains? No. No, these are not coffins. These are transfer cases. Two weeks ago, Obama flew to Dover for a surprise middle of the night salute to the fallen as their transfer cases were transferred. Transfer cases. I mean, not only were photos banned at Dover, but now we can't even say coffin. This is Washington Post, by the way, just a, an article picked up by the Seattle Times. So, if people recognize that torture doesn't work, fair question, then why did we do it? Why did we do it? Why do you suppose? If it's proven, as I am morally certain, that torture can get, not get you reliable information, then why would you do it? Provide propaganda? Provide propaganda? Pardon? <coughs> propaganda. To produce propaganda? To produce propaganda? Oh, there you go. If it's not reliable information you, you want, if it's unreliable information, man, I'll tell you, torture works like a T. <laughs> now, I'm not talking abstract here. There's a fellow named Ibn al-Sheikh Alibi, a Libyan national, who was picked up uh, and actually had some role in running the, the training camps for Osama bin Laden. You know, he, he, he sort of paid the travel expenses and helped to recruit people to come to the training camps. And so he was about as close as they were going to get to Osama bin Laden. And they knew, okay, they knew that he knew about how many Al-Qaeda were trained in Iraq. Except he didn't know because there weren't any trained in Iraq. But in 2002, there was a big, big premium, big premium on making sure that they proved a connection between Saddam Hussein and 9-11. 
What percentage of the American people do you think believed that there was that tie as we entered the war in March 2003? Anyone? 69%. Yeah, 69% was the best figure. So it worked. I mean, this is uh, Joseph, Joseph Goebbels uh, rejoicing in his grave. Man, these guys really know how to, how to do the propaganda. Well, there weren't any ties. Or watching Fox News. Now, what they did, of course, uh, was they said, now, Alibi, you won't tell us. You won't tell us about the ties between Saddam Hussein and Al Qaeda. And so we're going to send you to the Egyptians because they know, how to, they know how to get this kind of information. And so they did. He was tortured unmercifully. And guess what he admitted to? Anybody can guess? That Saddam Hussein and Iraq were training Al Qaeda in the use of chemical and biological weapons. Now, what happened to that information? It was sent back to Washington immediately and used by Vice President Cheney in his major speech of August 26, 2002, where he really set the terms of reference for what was going to happen. Saddam Hussein is building, reconstituting his nuclear weapons. He's got all manner of chemical and biological weapons. Uh, don't think about UN inspectors, the inspections, they just give you a false sense of security. We got to go get them, okay? And he used Alibi's report, knowing full well that the Defense Intelligence Agency had already blackballed him as a prevaricator, as somebody who didn't know what he's talking about. So on the 7th, on the 26th of August, Cheney used it. On the 7th of sep September, the president used it, three days before the congressional vote, to give him power to invade Iraq, okay? And then uh, our friend Colin Powell used it on the 5th of, uh, of February the next year. So, you know, it's really handy stuff if you're not interested in, in reliable information, but rather unreliable information. As I say, it works like a charm. Now, I've learned in my old age, and maybe some of you, I see a couple of people with a touch of gray in their hair. Maybe you've had the same experience, but I learned too late to listen to my own children. Uh, but I do listen to my grandchildren. And we have eight of those. And uh, at one point about six years ago, I was, I got, I got on Lehrer, you know, it's sort of a rare, rare sort of thing. I guess it was a change in directors for the CIA and they couldn't find anybody else. So I got on there and I told Rita, my wife, and she immediately called Kathleen out in Oakland. Uh, Dad's gonna be on, on TV, you might wanna watch it. So she did with little Claire, four years old. They watched the Lara thing. And when it was over, Kathleen turned off the TV and Claire went up to her and said, Mommy, Mommy, that was Grandpa. And uh, Kathleen said, yeah. She said, well, well, Mommy, that means the other people are real too. <laughs> That's cute, isn't it? But you know what, folks? Think about it. Think about it. If you don't know someone in the picture, the other people aren't real, too. We don't even have pictures of what's going on in Afghanistan and Iraq by design. Because the pictures, if you'd believe the right, made us lose the war in Vietnam. It was all that terrible publicity, you know. So what does that mean? Well, that means something pretty profound, I think. Because uh, if you can't establish a personal connection with these folks, all the more so when they don't really look like you. Uh, they're a different color. They wear strange things on their head. We teach our soldiers to call them camel jockeys, towel heads, sand niggers. It's very easy to dehumanize people like that. And dehumanization uh, leads very easily to torture. That's the reality, folks. Uh, you know, there's, there have been these things happen in history before. I'm thinking of, uh, of uh, Germany in the 30s. We know that uh, the Germans were obedient, and we know that the German churches, Catholic and Lutheran, could not find their voices. Um, maybe you don't know that one of the first things that Hitler did when he came into full power was to make sure that there was a pastor in every single parish in Germany. Whether it was Lutheran, whether it was Catholic, he needed a pastor in every church, and he ensured that that would happen. Why? Why do you suppose? 
he thought that that would be a force of stability for his regime. And unfortunately, he was right. The Germans call it the Schweigen, the silence. Uh, people look to churches for moral leadership. And if the pastor says nothing, if the pastor owes his job as much to the Nazis as he does to the church, he's not going to say anything. And people will get the idea, well, you know, it may, must be all right. Otherwise, he or she would say something. Now, there was, there was Dietrich Bonhoeffer, for example, the very gutsy Lutheran pastor who tried to set up something called the Confessing Church, something true to Jesus of Nazareth's behavior and ideals. He got uh, wrapped up and, and eventually hanged. But there was another fellow named, uh, Die, uh, was, his name was, uh, pardon? Jagersteiner was an Austrian, and he, he too stood up to the Nazis. But the fellow that I'm thinking about, his name is Haushofer, Albrecht Haushofer. Anybody know about Albrecht Haushofer? Good, because I'm going to tell you. Uh, he was a geologue, okay, a geologist, uh, sort of a geogra geographer uh, at the University of Berlin, and he had tenure. Now, I think some people here in this audience know what tenure means, okay? <laughs> He had tenure, and he had tenure because he kept his mouth shut. And as he watched his Jewish neighbors getting wrapped up one by one, his conscience got the better of him. He started speaking out. Actually, he created quite a little following among himself there. And uh, he represented a threat to the regime, so they wrapped him up, put him in a different Berlin prison, and uh, sentenced him to death. Now, um, the SS Gestapo would uh, use two means of killing you. Either they'd hang you, like uh, uh, Bonhoeffer was hanged, or they'd uh, shoot you, and uh, Haushofer was going to be shot. But before they would shoot him, uh, the Germans are very meticulous, and of course, he would have to uh, sign a confession. I mean, they needed the paperwork, right? So they insisted that he sign a confession, and he resisted, he wouldn't sign it. And they got so angry as the Allies became uh, very much closer to Berlin that they shot him anyway. And as they picked him up from, picked him up from the floor, there was a little settle, a little piece of paper. And it was his confession. Some of you probably know German. I'll recite his confession, it's very brief. It's in the form of a sonnet, okay? And he wrote it very carefully. And the title was Schuld. Anyone? Guilt. Guilt, right. And it said, Doch bin ich schuldig, aber anders als ihr denkt. Yes, I'm guilty, but it's not what you're thinking. Ich musste früher meine Pflicht erkennen. I should have früher, earlier, recognized my flicht, my, my duty. Ich muss der Schärfer Unheil, Unheil nennen. I should have Schärfer, more sharply called evil, evil. Mein Urteil habe ich zu lang gelenkt. I put off my judgment far too long. Ich habe gewarnt, I did warn, aber nicht genug, genug, enough, und klar. Klar, claro, claro. So I did warn, but not enough and not clearly enough. Ich habe gewarnt, aber nicht genug und klar. Und heute weiß ich, was ich schuldig war. And today, I know what I was guilty of. Martin Luther King, one of the most poignant things he, he had to say was, um, there is such a thing as too late. Now, can we, can we train ourselves or can we come back to the notion where we're supposed to care for one another? Can we live with the, the notion that our country has been, um, has been torturing other people? I uh, wrote an article several months ago in which I said people from the Judeo-Christian uh, uh, heritage uh, you know, a really, really special reason uh, to oppose torture, since Jesus of Nazareth, after all, was tortured to death. 
and I got an email from a friend of mine. And he said, Ray, you got to change your tune here. I'm an atheist. I know that torture is wrong. I've been doing just as much as you have to oppose it. Torture is wrong because human beings instinctively know that they're not to abuse other human beings in this way. So, you know, nice that you brag about your Judeo-Christian heritage, but don't think that that's necessary because it's not. People know that instinctively. And I took a lesson from that, and that's, uh, you know, that's something that we really need to, uh, to, to home in on because, uh, uh, because it is uh, an instinctive thing. I think it's a natural thing for us to care for one another. I had an experience about five years ago when those very courageous women of Code Pink arranged to have Iraqi professional women come here during the spring, uh, come to the United States and uh, speak in various locales. And um, Scott Ritter, uh, Faisa El Jarati, a woman engineer from Baghdad who was responsible in part for the water purification plants in Baghdad and I were touring around the very liberal uh, Bay Area, okay? So we did Palo Alto, uh, we did uh, uh, the theater in Oakland there, and then we, were, then we were in Santa Cruz. And I could tell that FISA was getting more and more kind of agitated as which each, each night that we, that we talked. And in Santa Cruz, uh, we were given the kind of welcome you would expect, a very prosperous, very, very welcoming environment, a very warm welcome. And, uh, and then uh, Scott and I talked, and FISA got up, and she shared what had happened in Iraq to her family. She was in exile in Jordan to our brother, uh, to people who were in prison, people who were being tortured. And she poured out her guts. And uh, she got the same kind of, oh, isn't that too bad reaction. And she came back, I'll never forget it. She came back and we were sitting like the little panel here. And I was sitting here and she was here. And she came back and she wrote me a note. She grabbed my pad and she wrote this. When we come here, people very welcoming, I feel good. I felt people care. Uh, people against the policies of war and torture. But Bush and Cheney don't listen. I think of what's happening to my people as they don't listen. And I tell you all what's happening to my people and the people, however pleasant, shake their heads and they say, oh, that's terrible, but what can we do? What can we do? Always, what can we do? I feel sick. And she put the pad in front of me. Now, I'm not the most perceptive person. But I know when peak moments arrive, usually, and I knew this was one, and I knew how to figure it out. And I knew I couldn't figure it out by myself. So I wrote an email that evening to Victoria, uh, one of my co-teachers at the Servant Leadership School at this Church of the Savior. I said, Victoria, I know this is important. I really, really are aching to, to understand it. Uh, why is it resonating so much? And she wrote right back. The next morning, I had this email. I said, Ray, you remember when we were doing the uh, racial sensitivity uh, program? It's a Mennonite program. It's called The Road to Emmaus. It's wonderful. I recommend it highly. Remember how they divided the uh, African Americans from the whites and uh, our instructor, an African American man, uh, looked at us and he said, you know, <laughs> yeah, I had to tell you, you white people, you're really, 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 you're really, uh, you're really something, you know? Um, you don't like uh, racism and uh, you, you want to act against it, but all you can think of saying is, what can we do? What can we do? Now, you have on your backs, whether you know it or not, a knapsack full of white privilege. Privileges that, for the most part, you didn't gain from your own sweat. 
uh, privileges, accidents of birth, education, the privileges, the privileges, they're in your white back knapsack. And among those privileges is power. And if you dragged out that power from those privileges and put it into play, you could change things. You could change things in a way that people without power cannot, cannot even aspire to change things. Well, I wrote back and said, thanks, Victoria. I think that's what I was, was gravitating toward, but I couldn't quite put my, uh, put my finger on. So what does that mean? Well, how do we change things? Well, I think uh, after I finished here, and it won't be very long, um, Rob will be talking a little bit about what uh, the, the uh, Washington State Campaign Against Torture is doing. And I suggest that you listen attentively. Uh, and our, the National Religious Campaign Against Torture nation, nationwide is doing a lot of good things. Uh, they have a statement that's going out next, uh, next week against, uh, well, it's a, a statement urging the president to hold fast with his promise on Guantanamo. And there are all, all kinds of interesting things that they have done. For example, they have helped to promote and to succeed in promoting a Rush Holt. So, a representative from New Jersey, Princeton area. He has had legislation for four or five years saying that every interrogation needs to be videotaped, every one. And, uh, and NRCAD has, has succeeded with others, of course, in getting that through. And you know, uh, it, it is helpful as uh, some of the, well, I'm terribly grateful for my, my Catholic upbringing and the uh, more recent uh, in education that I've got at Georgetown University about what Yahweh of the Hebrew Scriptures and Jesus of the New really care about. And it's really easy, folks. It's that we do justice. You know, it's like what Isaiah says in his first chapter. You know, it's not prancing around swinging thoroughfares and uh, making incense. It's doing justice, okay? So I'm very grateful for all that. And every now and then there's kind of a, a, a gleaming thing comes through. And I want to share one with you. This has to do with a light, a light colonel, a lieutenant colonel called Vandevelt. And he was a real gung-ho uh, army lawyer. And he went out to Guantanamo and he found out that uh, the justice was being perverted right and left, uh, that uh, people were hiding evidence so that they could convict, convict people, and people were just acting very irresponsibly. And he was between a rock and a hard place because he wanted to do his job. Uh, he enjoyed the army. and. Uh, he said uh, this in an article he wrote, I wasn't able to discuss any of these cases I was working on with family or friends because it was privileged information. As I sank deeper and deeper into despair, I turned to a Jesuit priest who had written and spoken widely about justice. Some of you may know of him, Father John Deere. I could not give Father John much detail, and I sent him an email and I told him what the situation was. And um, he wrote right back and he says, quit. It's simple, don't be a part of this, quit. <laughs> and, uh, and so L Lieutenant Colonel Vandervelt, three days later, quit. Now I talked to John Deere about this a couple months ago. He hasn't been in touch with Vandervelt at all, but he does know the story. And he says, yeah, I got this email out of the blue. I didn't know Vandervelt from, the, from, you know, from Adam. Uh, and so I said, well, you know, the way he describes it, I'll just write this off, quit, send it off, never expecting any, any reaction. So there is, a, there is a, a place for prophetic people. There is a place for people who come out of religious tradition or any humanistic tradition to do the right thing. And Vandervelt, I think, is not a unique case. There are lots of other things that uh, can be applied. But what, what I'd like to talk about a little bit is uh, uh, what we do as prophetic Abrahamic people. And that includes Judeo-Christian, the prophet, Islam. Uh, what does it mean to be a prophet? You know, it, it doesn't mean foretelling the future, of course. You know what it means. It means standing up for truth and for justice. Isaiah, for example. I don't know if any of you know this, but I learned that uh, 
Isaiah was, uh, was prompted to go around stark naked for three years. Now, uh, biblical exegetes, without any sense of humor at all, uh, say that, uh, no, no, it's not clear that he was always naked just during liturgical services. <laughs> Now, that, that may be good exegesis, but it does not let the man off the hook, does it? Okay? What was he saying, folks? What was Isaiah saying to the Jews of that time? He was saying, look, I strip myself of my clothes, and you say, oh, isn't that terrible what he's doing, stripping himself of his clothes? You, you are stripped of the vision with which Yahweh blessed you, a vision of, of justice and of shalom. Your nakedness is far more culpable than mine. Now, you got to hear the rest of the story. Uh, tradition has it that Isaiah was sewn in half by a very dull wooden saw. And prophets very often don't come to a, a, a very happy end. But, but there's, there's someone who was, who was called upon to speak out and did so in a kind of a bizarre way. Now, some of us might say, well, you know, that's just like me. I'm a little, you know, eccentric and, you know, eccentron out, out of the center. And, um, but, uh, you know, we have to check with our, our folks there, make sure that we have a sanity check because uh, we might be just kooks, you know. We have to be careful what we do. Well, what I'd like to do is just to say that uh, Martin Luther King uh, did point out elsewhere that sometimes you have to put your body into it. Sometimes you have to put your body into it. Chavez, Cesar Chavez, used to always say, op-eds are great, writings are great, speeches a little bit greater, but nothing's going to happen without action. Nothing's going to happen unless we take action. Um, Dan Berrigan, who is one of my, my favorite prophets, um, I was educated by Jesuits, and Dan is the best of the breed. Um, you know what he did about Vietnam. Uh, and let me tell you something else he did long after Vietnam. He went down to South Africa one Easter season, and uh, South Africa was still suffering under apartheid. And knowing Dan, you won't be surprised that he, he spoke out at, at some of these white churches. And after one service, the, the white uh, congregation was up in arms, and they came up and said, Now, Father Berrigan, Father Berrigan, if we do what you tell us to do, uh, we'll be put in jail. And then what will happen to our children? And Dan looked them straight in the eye, and he said, And if you are not put in jail, what then happens to your children? We're at that kind of moment now. Our civil liberties are severely endangered. It looks like we might be facing a widened war in Afghanistan. Now is the time. Uh, just for uh, refreshing my mind, I uh, looked up uh, the old uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau here. Uh, Thoreau's uh, piece on uh, civil disobedience, 1849. Uh, he wouldn't pay the poll tax because he didn't want to pay any taxes to a country that was uh, going on, on a war of aggression. This is where we, we incorporated Texas, you know, the Mexican War. You know, on second thought, I think, uh, I think Henry David Thoreau was, you know, <laughs> had a really good idea there. but. Anyway. <laughs> So the only tax, there was no, no income tax, so he re refused to pay his poll tax, right? And they put him in jail. And uh, the story goes, and I think it's true because there's lots of sources, um, Emerson visits Thoreau in jail. Many of you know this story. He says, Henry, what are you doing in there? And Thoreau says, that's not the question. Waldo, what are you doing out there? It was an act of conscience. Thoreau argued that we will eventually lose our capacity to make the distinction what's morally, what's morally correct and what is numb. Now, um, Thoreau was asked at the end of his life, you know, have you made your peace with God? 
And he said, well, I never really quarreled with him. <laughs> and uh, I think he meant that uh, if he you know, quarreled with his own conscience and did what his conscience told him not to do, then maybe he'd have to make his peace with God then. Civil disobedience ends up on a happy note. After Thoreau's release, actually he didn't want to be released, but people paid for his release, got him out. He was actually angry at that. After his release, uh, and a very unpleasant reception from his neighbors. I don't know if any of you have encountered unpleasant receptions from your neighbors, but I have. Um, the children of Concord brightened his mood by urging him to join a huckleberry hunt. Now, huckleberrying was one of Thoreau's valued pastimes, and his skill at locating hidden huckleberries made him a favorite of all the children in Concord. And if a child stumbled, spilling the berries, he would kneel by the weeping child and explain that if children didn't stumble and spill huckleberries, they would never scatter and they would never grow into new seeds and new bushes. So at the end of his um, civil disobedience, he says this. So I put it behind me and I joined the huckleberry party. The children were impatient to put themselves under my conduct. And in half an hour, I was in the midst of a huckleberry field on one of our highest hills, two miles off, and then the state was nowhere to be seen, and his conscience was clear. I think that uh, we have to remember in all this awful stuff, I, I try to figure out whether there's any kind of joke that would fit in one of these presentations because it's such dismal, dismal stuff. Um, just to keep my, my uh, sanity, we have to remember, it seems to me, that uh, uh, Teilhard de Chardin was right when he said, joy is the unimpeachable sign of the presence of God. We're called to be joyful people, even amidst all this, all this terrible stuff. And so I would like to, again, steal from my Irish heritage to tell you about another prophet. And he's out of William Butler Yeats, and his name is the Fiddler of Dooney. I'll close with this. When I play my fiddle in Dooney, folk dance like a wave of the sea. My brother is priest in Kilvarnet, my cousin in Bachnabawi. I passed my brother and cousin, they read from their book of prayer. I read from my book of song that I bought at the Sligo Fair. When we reached the end of time with Peter sitting in state, he'll call the three old souls, but he'll ask me first for the gate. For the good are always the merry, save by an evil chance, and the merry love the fiddle, and the merry love to dance. And when the folk there see me, they'll all run up to me saying, here's the fiddler of Dooney, and they'll dance like a wave of the sea. So I wish you justice in the spirit of Abraham, Isaiah, Jesus of Nazareth, the prophet, Rachel Corey, Dan Berrigan. And I wish you joy in the spirit of the fiddler of Dooney. Thank you very much. It's a fair question. And metanoia means uh, literally from the Greek to take your mind and turn it upside down, OK? So um, I regret to admit that there was no metanoia. I took a job with the CIA in the analytic ranks, and our job was to speak truth to power without regard to political or other kinds of agendas. And I was able to do that for almost the entire 27 years that I worked there. What Truman envisaged in setting up the CIA in 1947 was one place that would be a central place, okay, so it would be 
the Central Intelligence Agency, which would have access to all information on a given issue or country, it would be, for the younger here, the, the, the undergraduates, you probably don't realize this, but we used to have actually inboxes made out of wood, you know. <laughs> and we'd have a little in here and an outbox over there. Um, into my inbox would come all manner of information having to do with my area, which was Soviet foreign policy toward China, the rest of Asia, including Vietnam. It was my job to be uh, – the word is banned from in Washington, D.C., but I suppose it's all right here – to be accountable, okay? <laughs> to be accountable for looking through that stuff, and if there was an important story that the president should know, or his chief advisors, I would write that up. And assuming that it, would, it made sense, uh, it, it could appear on the president's desk the next morning. We spoke without, without fear, and uh, uh, for most of the tenure that I was there for, um, we honored what Truman wanted, and that was to be able to go to the director out there in Langley and say, look, Mr. Director, I want you to tell me what you and those, those two universities worth of uh, specialists you have out there in the woods of Virginia, what you really think about this. For example, uh, Mr. Director, uh, these uh, generals with the blue suits on are telling me they have a really fancy plane called a B-52 and they can bomb the Ho Chi Minh Trail and close it down in such a way that Ho Chi Minh might, might give up. Well, what do you guys think? You know, we had to suppress a laugh. A lot of us, not me, but a lot of my older colleagues had been through Korea been through World War II, knew that bombing didn't work that way, okay? Some of my colleagues had actually carried Ho Chi Minh into Hanoi after the war on their shoulders. And they knew the Ho Chi Minh was going to give up, that uh, bombing would just increase his, his uh, resistance. And besides that, we told the president, uh, you know, Mr. President, uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail doesn't look anything like I-5. Or, or I-66, you know? You can't even see it from the air for the most part. It's about 120 little trails in the jungle. So, you know, sorry, but we don't think, number one, that you can seal off the Ho Chi Minh Trail, <laughs> trails, plural. N number two, we don't think that this will do anything other than harden North Vietnam's resistance. Now, the other part of the story, of course, is that the president has other considerations. First and foremost in LBJ's mind was he didn't want to be the first U.S. president to lose a war, right? And so as long as there was any hope, as long as there was anybody he could go to, Richard Russell or the, 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 the generals with the blue suits or whatever, you know, he was willing to try that. And we know the rest of that story. So these are just the little examples about what our job really was. Uh, just to finish up on this, um, that's why we from the analytic ranks were uh, – outrage doesn't do it. Outrage is sort of a pale expression of how we felt when we saw our profession being corrupted for the express purpose of deceiving our elected representatives out of their constitutional prerogative to declare or otherwise authorize war. That's as bad as it gets, okay? That's really bad. And so that's when we set up the veteran intelligence professionals for sanity. Now, what came out of the, uh, of the attempts by the Bush administration to falsify the intelligence was that awful estimate which told Congress on the 1st of October uh, 2002 that Saddam Hussein had all manner of weapons of mass destruction, he was working on a nuclear weapon as well, uh, and that there were ties between Iraq and Al-Qaeda. It was the worst kind of prostitution of the intelligence process, and it's greased the skids for war. It doesn't get any worse than that. Now, I have some good news. After that happened, new people were brought in, people from the State Department intelligence, people who still knew how to tell the truth. And so, two years ago, exactly two years ago, some of you may remember that President Bush, Vice President Cheney, were alarming this nation and others at the danger from Iran because it was near to getting a nuclear weapon, and it would use that weapon, and it was a danger not only to Israel but to the rest of the world, including the United States. And what did the estimate say? 
the estimate said, the Iraqi government ceased working on the weapons-related part of its nuclear program in the fall of 2003 and has not restarted it. That judgment holds. Now, what did that do? My friends, that helped prevent a war. Dick Cheney has bragged about how strongly he was, he was pressing for war against Iran. And what really did, did the war in was when the generals and the admirals, Admiral Fallon uh, from CENTCOM, Admiral Mullen, they didn't want to be on the receiving end of orders from Cheney or Bush saying, you know, zap Iran. They knew what that would mean. And so they insisted that the intelligence findings be published. And they were. And it took all the pizzazz right out of the, the juggernaut for war. So there's still a baby that should not be thrown out with a bathwater, okay? Now, how about the bathwater? How'd that get in there? Before he died, President Truman wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post on the 22nd of August about the CIA. This is 1963, okay? I'm sorry, not August. Um, it was after, uh, after our country overthrew the duly elected regime in, in Tehran, uh, and after President Kennedy was assassinated. So this is December, December 22nd, to, uh, 1963. And what he said was, this is not the CIA that I wanted created. They shouldn't be in the business of overthrowing governments or doing other covert action types of things. If you want to do that, you put that in a separate agency. Or you don't do it at all, but don't have it in the agency that I set up. Now, long story short, I worked in the, the agency that Truman envisaged. What happened after the war is all the spies that overthrew governments and, uh, and did terribly imaginative things in the European and Asia theater, they came back in 1946 and said, uh, thanks for all the applause, but uh, you, you still need us? Question answered itself. The Russians had taken over Eastern Europe. The KGB was all around the world causing all kinds of havoc. Italy was about to fall to the communists, at least uh, it looked that way. And so the question answered itself, of course we need you. And then some idiot, and I use the, the term advisedly, some idiot said, hey, I know what we can do. We're creating this secret agency. Um, let's, let's put this capability for covert action there in the, in the CIA. And so from the very beginning, you had a structural fault. You had one director responsible for unadulterated, tell it like it is intelligence, and you had the president authorized to tell this director to make war in Nicaragua, make war in Vietnam, overthrow the government in Chile, and that kind of stuff. It doesn't work, okay? It doesn't work. And so what should happen is that part of the agency should be lopped off, and if you need it, well, set up a separate agency. Don't have it supervised by Congress, because with all due respect, Congress can't do the job. They're just too political. What you need is some independent body, maybe retired judges or something, to, to look at what the covert action people are doing. Or you could give the real agency a chop on whether a covert action thing makes any sense. And I must say that while I was serving under uh, Director Colby, he did give us substantive people, us analysts, uh, a look at some of the covert action proposals, and we had uh, the ability to say, you know, this is cockamamie stuff, you know, this is gonna be, it's gonna backfire, it doesn't make any sense, and very often we were able to, to nip them in the bud. Not all of them, but some of them. So what I'm saying here is that, uh, <laughs> that my, uh, I, I didn't have a metanoia, I didn't fall off my horse, uh, I retired uh, 20 years ago almost, uh, having pretty much done what I wanted to do there. Um, my favorite area, the Soviet Union, had just imploded. That's what I had my real expertise in. I was 50 years old and I had served enough time overseas that I could get a media annuity and I wanted to work down in the inner city. 
And with the immediate annuity, if some no nonprofit would give me a job that pay the, pay the difference or some of the difference, I could do what I really wanted to do. So it wasn't falling off my horse. It was observing what had happened to the agency, and that was another factor that, you know, it wasn't the same place. It had been politicized. It had been politicized starting with uh, Director Casey and Bobby Gates, uh, who was uh, named the chief analyst. And now, of course, we have him as the defense secretary. So it's kind of a long story, but uh, sorry to take, take this long to answer it. But, you know, it was really a, a gradual, uh, well, I, I spoke out because I've never seen our government do anything so crashly uh, uh, illegal, immoral. I hadn't seen it start a, a major war of aggression, which Nuremberg defined as the supreme international crime, differing from other war crimes only in as much it, as it contains the accumulated evil of the whole, okay? Talk about demons, the accumulated evil of the whole. Well, think torture, folks. Think kidnapping without telling wives or children or the Red Cross where, where these people were. All those accumulated evils flow, flowed from that uh, war of aggression, and that's pretty much what turned me into a, a very harsh critic of what was going on. Now, this is a really tough one. Uh, there seem to be two tracks that people pursue. One is the prosecution angle, and the other one is a kind of a, an educational thing. Um, there are really good arguments for both. Uh, the crimes are clear. The documentation is, is copious. And so I applaud Attorney General Holder uh, for telling the president he was going to pursue uh, some of these other crimes that have been committed. Um, but we also need an educative uh, kind of body. We need, a, we need some kind of commission that would have some pretense or, or some legitimate claim, better still, to uh, objectivity and to honesty. Uh, I contrast that with the 9-11 Commission, which uh, failed miserably. Uh, actually, Governor Kane and Lee Hamilton has, have admitted that they were set up to fail. Their words in their book. We weren't given enough money, we weren't given enough time, we weren't given enough access to sensitive information. We were set up to fail. So it would have to be something that uh, was set up very, very carefully and was able to be looked upon as a uh, legitimate, uh, unbiased, uh, you know, investigatory thing. And I don't know of any precedent that our, our country has. Uh, the precedent in South Africa, uh, I think there are as many uh, uh, non-parallels with that has parallels. So uh, to the degree we need something, we need both. Uh, I'm glad that the prosecutors are at work, but you know a lot of that work is done in secret. What has anybody heard of from John Durham? He's the government prosecutor in Connecticut who started in January of 2007 to look into the destruction of the CIA tapes, 92 of them, of the harsh interrogations. Now, he hasn't said a peep, and that's good. Hopefully, he's doing his job. But the point is that if the American people aren't educated as to what really happened, and you can't expect that from what I call the fawning corporate media, then you need some kind of body, some kind of commission to let all this stuff get out get up in the air so that people, you know, a commission couldn't be totally ignored, even by the phony corporate media, I don't think. Well, the time-honored uh, dialogue, rapport-building techniques are the best ones that uh, human nature knows about. Uh, the FBI has used them actually with some of these, these same high-level high or high-value detainees to good effect. So we get back to that. You have to realize, you have to tell your folks, your, your friends, that torture just doesn't work. I mean, it stands to reason people are going to tell you anything they want uh, if you torture them enough. Uh, some of these guys were, were waterboarded 80, well, 83 times for, uh, for uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and 183 times for, for Abu Zubaydah. There might be vice versa there. Now, t you tell me that the rationale to explain that was uh, the imminence of hostility, the imminence of a, of a terrorist threat. It's a specious argument. When people argue that, you know, after 9-11, 
we were just so panicky about the next attack that we uh, we did everything we could uh, to make sure, within the law, of course, to make sure that we had information about it. Now, that's a lie. That's a bald-faced lie. Zacharias Musawi. He was the fellow in Minnesota who was learning how to fly a 747, didn't much care about uh, takeoff or less still landing. He just wanted to learn how to steer this thing, okay? The FBI people in Minnesota fingered him as a terrorist. The French service gave us that, that information, okay? And what happened to that? Uh, nothing happened to that. So what we need to do is uh, uh, use the time-honored things to interview Zacharias Musawi. Now, why do I mention him? Because, would you believe it? Nobody interviewed Zacharias Musawi until his trial, many, many, many months later. Why is that important? Because he knew this fellow Reed. Remember the, the shoe bomber? The guy that very easily could have downed a, a, a jet aircraft with, I think it was about 170 people on it, crossing the Atlanta, he, he, the Atlantic. He he knew he knew this fellow Reed, and he could have told us about him. We were lucky. Some passengers put out the fire before he could have the shoe bomb go off. So Reed was he interrogated? No, he wasn't interrogated. Why? Well. Uh, they wanted to make a prosecutorial case here, and uh, they want to put these guys behind bars and didn't want to endanger any of the interrogation techniques or interview techniques or anything else. So they didn't interview these folks. So you tell me that they left no stone unturned. They didn't. They let these two guys, who had unique access to information about Al-Qaeda, they let them sit in jail without even interviewing them. I know that because of the public record. I also know it from Colleen Rowley who is the FBI lawyer uh, who blew the whistle on what happened at FBI headquarters when the folks in, uh, in Minneapolis tried their damnedest to get access to Musawi's computer before 9-11, and they were not given access to it. So, so don't believe people when they say, you know, we were so shell-shocked and so worried about the next attack and that we uh, maybe took a few liberties, all within the law, of course, uh, but left no stone unturned. Well, there's two big stones, Musawi and Reed, that were already interviewed. Uh, the torturers or the interrogators have all been told to adhere to the Army Manual the one that was put out in, in 2006 by uh, General Kimmons. Uh, so there's a, a government-wide prohibition about going past the manual. Now, what are the reports from the field? Well, there are lots of reports that the, the sadists in Gitmo and uh, Bagram in Afghanistan and else, elsewhere are sort of, you know, taking their last licks on the prisoners. Uh, with the prospect that they won't be able to do it anymore. Um, I don't know how much substance there is to that, but I do know that uh, the folks in Guantanamo that were on hunger, hunger strikes, uh, do you remember the ones that were force-fed through their nose into their stomach? I mean, that's against international law right there. Uh, that a couple of them, uh, one of them died under very mysterious circumstances. He had been uh, an advocate for the others, and all of a sudden he disappears and dies. And of course, they say he committed suicide. Um, you know, even the ones that do commit suicide, uh, and many have tried, and only I think about four or five have succeeded. What what kind of reaction do we get? Well, the uh, commanding general said, "Well, this is a very clever." example of asymmetrical warfare. A very clever PR move. And the Assistant Secretary for Public Relations of the State Department said, yeah, this is very dangerous because what they're trying to do is uh, uh, asymmetrical warfare. Well, give me a break. Now, I hope those people are no longer in their positions, but uh, the situation in, in, a, in bottom line is it's much better, but uh, uh, my guess is that a lot of stuff still goes on, um, partly because that's the kind of, uh, what, environment that's been created ever since the, the get-go in uh, 2001. 2001, okay? 
2001, folks. Who can tell me who the first person was that was tortured? You're right. Yeah, that's a good group here. The first person tortured was an American citizen named John Walker Lind, who happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, special Forces, uh, some CIA people, uh, gathered together some of the folks that, that he had just joined. He didn't even shoot a rifle during his tenure in Afghanistan. He's a misguided sort of young fella. And they, they wrapped them all up, and they didn't take the precaution of disarming all the prisoners. One had an AK-47. <laughs> and he sprayed it around, uh, hit John Walker Lind, among others, but killed, killed a CIA officer. That's a no-no. That's like killing a Philadelphia cop. <laughs> so he was immediately, so John Walker Lind, who was also shot, was somehow identified with, with what happened there. And he was called, do you remember what they called him in the headlines? The American Taliban. Taliban, yeah. Now, what happened to him? Well, there was a young lawyer named Jessica Raddick, who was in the ethics part of the Department of Justice. And when she heard that American citizen had been wrapped up in, uh, in Afghanistan, she immediately issued orders. This is an American citizen, read him his rights, make sure he has a lawyer before you ask him any questions. Chertoff, who was head of that part of the FBI at the time, later became head of uh, Homeland Security, thumbed his nose at Jessica Rack Raddick or anybody else, told the, told the military out there and the FBI, do what you ever want to these, these folks. And so they, uh, they tortured John Walker Lynn for about three or four days, unmercifully, wounded as he was. Uh, he recovered and came back home. And uh, when he came home and the, the, the case was going to be brought to the judge, Guess what? Chertoff recognized that, whoa, this could be trouble. And so he convened at a weekend meeting with John Walker Lynn's lawyers and Justice Department folks, and they did a plea bargain. In return for your keeping quiet about the torture, John Walker Lynn, we'll let you off with, do you know how many years? 20. My God, I like to get my hands on that lawyer. <laughs> And John Walker Lynn has sat in jail for, it must be what, eight, eight years or so now. Um, so that was the first person toward it. That set the tone, okay? That set the tone. Because if the Justice Department is going to say, screw it, you don't have to read it, Ms. Wright, he's an American citizen, but hey, he's with the Taliban, we can, you know, and he might, you know. Did they expect to get some information out of John Walker Lynn? I can't believe they did. He had just joined the, the little motley group there in Afghanistan the week before. So, you know, it's really sort of a brutal sort of thing. And when somebody asked before why we torture, well, there is the, you know, the business about if you want unreliable information, that's a great way to get it. But there's also the intimidation factor. You know, they didn't disguise the fact that they were torturing people. And the lesson they wanted all, us all to take away is, you know, we mean business here. We're all powerful. We're the sole remaining superpower in the world. And, uh, you know, don't mess with us. And not only abroad, but to us, to you and me. Don't mess with us. I mean, Jose Padilla, he was an American citizen. He was born in New York, just as I was. And look what we did to him. So don't mess with us. We know what we're doing. Don't, you could, be, you could be named, I could be named when I came, come out of this room an enemy combatant by the president or by Robert Gates, who used to work for me and might wanna, might wanna do that because I gave him a lousy efficiency report. Uh, <laughs> no, seriously, I, you know, he was so damn ambitious that I, you know, I was a first line supervisor, this is 1972. And I thought, well, supervisors are supposed to tell the truth. And so I, I said, very bright guy, but he's in with a very bright branch. And his, his transparent ambition, the way he, he goes up the line at, at this, at this <laughs> slightest pretext, uh, is a disruptive influence in the branch. Uh, we have to watch his, he has, his ambition needs to be held in check. 
<laughs> and then, of course, he became supervisor of all analysis. And people said to me, you know, Ray, don't you regret that you gave him that kind of... I said, never, never will I regret. We'll, I mean, we'll find out in the future. And I think uh, it remains to be seen whether he uh, whether he's changed his colors. But uh, uh, so uh, the, the thing started on the evening of 9-11. Who remembers the account by Richard Clark of what happened in the situation, not the situation room, but in the bunker right after the speech to the nation? Who remembers what the president said? This is not, what's that? Well, that was the next night, okay? That was the 12th. But on the 11th, right after the speech, he, he got down there with Richard Clark and Rumsfeld and Tennant and a couple others. And somebody said, well, now we can't really flail out against other nations uh, that have, don't have much to do with what happened this morning. Uh, and, and the president, according to Richard Clark, who was there, said, I don't care what the international lawyers say, we're going to kick some ass. Now, Clark didn't make that up. That set the tone. Next thing you know, the president says to George Tenet on one of his morning meetings, hey, you got some guys uh, that you know, can do harsh interrogations? We want to make, you know, make sure we, uh, we do harsh interrogations. And Tenet goes off and checks at the agency and finds out there are 12 or 13 people left over from Vietnam that know about these things, and they have ties with contractors that they could get in to do. See, the CIA didn't have any capability for interrogations. It wasn't in our charter. The closest we came were people interviewing others uh, after lie detector tests or, or people who, who wanted security clearances. That's all we had. And so it was built up from scratch. But George Tenet came back and said, yeah, we can do this. We can do this. And, you know, that, that's, that's how it started. But, you know, when George Tenet came back, this is what he did. He said, uh, now, Mr. President, uh, we can do this. But uh, <laughs> this is a little awkward here. But um, we'll need you. <laughs> we'll need you. Would you please sign sign this this call of finding, and it authorizes this activity. And and frankly, my my guys aren't going to do anything else. Unless you could could you please sign this? Okay. Alberto, hey, get Al Gonzalez in here. <laughs> yes, Mr. President. <laughs> Al, can I sign this thing? Uh, Mr. President, could you give me a day to look into this? Because it's important and I want to make sure I check it out. Yeah, sure. So what does Alberto do? Right across the hall to the office of the Vice President of the United States, where sits in glorious splendor David Addington. Al says, uh, David? Um, the president's just been given this by the CIA, and uh, we're wondering if he can sign it. And what does Addington say? Al, you came to the right place. You came to the right place. I got a four-pager here, all set to go. Uh, for We ought to wait a decent interval, but let's give the president this four-pager tomorrow, and then he can authorize it. And that four-pager, I have it with me here. Okay, That was the basis. It was dated 25 January. 2002, and that was the basis upon which the president wrote a two-page memorandum dated February 7, 2000 and 2002, uh, which said, um, in accordance with the advice by Gonzalez and Addington, uh, Geneva is quaint, it's obsolete, and uh, we will treat detainees irrespective of Geneva uh, the Article 3 of Geneva doesn't apply, and we will treat them, bottom line, humanely, comma, as appropriate, comma, and as consistent with military necessity, comma, all in the general spirit of Geneva, period, end quote. Give me a break. You can't square that circle. Either you're going to obey Geneva, or you're not, and you can't be talking about the spirit of Geneva. Now, the supreme irony is that that memo, it's a two-pager, I have it right here. The fawning corporate press really hasn't made much of it, but the Senate 
Armed Services Committee point to that memo as opening the door to torture, their words, okay, without dissent. So that memo uh, was the one that, that set things rolling, and the irony comes in here because uh, we know about this memo since April, April of 2004. Now what else happened in April of 2004? Abu Ghraib, okay. So why were these memoranda released? Because as Gonzalez told a reporter, uh, we, uh, we wanna make sure that the public and the, the whole world knows that we treat, uh, the policy is to treat these uh, detainees humanely. <laughs> and he forgot what the darn thing said. I guess he just saw the title, which says, Humane Treatment of Al-Qaeda and Taliban Detainees. He released it to the press. It's out there. It's the smoking gun. It shows that the President of the United States set the torture in train. And the Senate Armed Services Committee has now said that publicly. Most people don't know that. And that maybe is, is the, the point that I'd like to leave you with. Um, the biggest sea change that I've witnessed in the 46 years that I've been in, in Washington is the fact that we no longer have in any real sense a free media. And that is so big. I mean, there's no more Watergate, there's no more Pentagon Papers, there's nothing out there unless you're really adept at the web. Now, if you, if you know how to get your way around the web, you can get more information than ever before, but how many Americans know where to look? And so, Americans are dumbed down, they're deprived of all this information, and when people say, well, torture really works and keeps us safe, uh, you know, they like to believe that. It's sort of a denial. They don't wanna, they don't wanna, you know, it's painful to think that your government, you know, on our behalf has acted that way to other human beings. But that is the case, and if we don't face up to that, you know, if we don't hold people accountable for that, well, I don't know what happens to our democracy. You know, I don't, want to have, I don't know what happens the next time a president comes in and says, well, you know, maybe we ought to torture this or that uh, breed of cat. Because I think it's exactly right that in, in our cat is, is appealing for a statute that uh, forbids this kind of thing. So, so the next president can't just reverse it with a new executive order. It's really, it's really very bizarre. That, my friend, is a, a question that uh, really calls for some comment. Uh, I was at a meeting with uh, Ramsey Clark about three years ago, and someone said all these things. You know, it happened before and it's you know really bad and you know how do you expect to do anything and what he said was this yeah that was then now is now we're alive now it's our duty to do what we can now let me just offer this suggestion we americans have one trait that i think is really really a bad one and that is that most of us are reluctant to really start anything particularly start anything important, unless we're reasonably sure that we're going to be successful, okay? Now, to the degree that deters us from taking action, that's a really insidious thing, in my view. We're not called to be successful, we're called to be faithful. The good is worth doing because it's good, okay? And the sooner we get it through our cross, that we may not be doing this for ourselves, but rather for our children or for our grandchildren, uh, that we will stand up like the good Germans did not stand up and make sure we can do everything we can to stop this torture until we do that, until we're willing to risk arrest, until we're willing to, to be arrested as I have for four times now. Uh, you know, uh, then, you know, it's a cop-out to say, well, we don't have any control. Uh, the government's really out of our hands. We are supposed to be a democracy. These things are done in our name, you know? And so it seems to me that it's up to us to divest ourselves from the certitude of success and just do what we can. And that's what I would appeal for each and every one of you to do, to end not only needless wars, but the, uh, the horrid practice of, of uh, of torture. I'll say just one more thing. Uh, I'm a half, <laughs> I'm a, a glass half full person, okay? I also have a big jet lag here, so, <laughs> okay? Now, what does that mean? That means that I see more hope than most of my colleagues, and the reason is this. 
against incredible opposition from everybody and his brother, from all the national security folks, the generals and the intelligence people, Obama faced up to them and said, I'm gonna release those four Department of Justice torture memos and I'm not gonna let them be redacted. How many of you have read any, read any of those torture memos? Ah, this is an unusual group. Usually, nobody has. Download them from the ACLU website and you'll see, you'll see why Obama, I think, released them. That and uh, now, of course, we have the CIA Inspector General report that was kept ever since May 2004 secret until August when it was released. Now, why did he do that in the face of that kind of opposition? Why did he uh, broaden the terms of reference of uh, John Durham, the prosecutor's um, uh, portfolio in uh, pursuing not only the destruction of the CIA interrogation tapes, but going after people who, you know, put loaded or put guns uh, uh, to the temple of masked uh, detainees and that kind of thing. Why? Well, I think Holt, well, I think as I said before, Holder read those memoranda, read the full Inspector General report from the CIA and decided this is sickening. I have to do something about it. He went to Obama and he said, I'm going to have to do something about it. I'm, I'm the Attorney General. I'm supposed to pursue the facts and do justice. And Obama, I'm guessing, said, damn, I want to look forward. But okay, go ahead. <laughs> All right? Now, those are big. Those are really big. I mean, what happened? What happened when he authorized that? Do you remember what the previous the past CIA directors did? Who remembers? What'd they do? They wrote a letter, wrote a letter to whom? To the president. And they said, please, please, be reasonable. Don't go after these people. And then there's one royal line in it. It says, there's no guarantee. We're very concerned. There's no guarantee that the limited terms of reference laid out for the uh, government prosecutor won't be bridged and it will become a wider investigation. And maybe, you know, three of those seven were in power when all this stuff happened. George Tenet, Porter Goss, and Michael Hayden. So, you know, you have the most transparent and most irregular, not even discussing whether it's legal to ask for an investigation that has been authorized by the Attorney General to stop. I mean, there are some that argue that that's uh, accessory after the fact, you know? So there they go, and they argue this thing, and, um, you know, I, Panetta was right in there with them, and so I'm calling them Panetta and the Seven Dwarfs. <laughs> and they are dwarfs, they're moral dwarfs, and the situation that the CIA has come to at this point uh, is due to those uh, those celebrated directors who say, please don't investigate uh, us for being to for approving torture because it might expand the investigation to involve others like other directors. It's just you know really really bizarre that they thought they could do that. How do they think they could get away with that? Well, because the Washington Post and New York Times are rooting for them. Washington Post and New York Times are talking to retired and ex-CIA officials who are saying how terrible this would be. And, uh, you know, the crowning thing is, it gets me is, they were only following orders. What does that sound like? Now, that was dismissed at Nuremberg as, you know, com completely inadequate defense. Now, I'm not saying that it's best to go after the, you know, the Lindy, the in England equivalents to the CIA people that were torturing people. But I think that it's a hopeful start. You know why? And again, this is just me. My, my colleagues are much more pessimistic. I'm thinking that, okay, they go after the fellow who held the, uh, the revolver to the hooded uh, detainee. They know who he is, and they say, that violated even the very permissive regulations of our very permissive Department of Justice. And so we're going to hang you out to dry. What's he going to do? Is he going to be like Lindy England from Abu Ghraib and say, oh gosh, okay. Uh, or is he going to hire a military lawyer? No. What he's going to do is get himself a good lawyer, okay? 
And what's that lawyer going to do? He's going to say, well, my client was instructed to do this by A, B, C, and D. And here's one of the orders. And A, B, C, and D's lawyers are going to say, oh, our client was instructed to do this by E, F, G, and H. And by the time they get up to L, M, N, and O, and P, it's going to be George Tenet, Richard, uh, not Richard, but uh, what's it, Dick Cheney, uh, the president, and Don Rumsfeld. And that'll be a good thing. Now, that may be too optimistic, but that's the way the judicial system works. And there are probably few people here who remember Watergate, but that's how they did Watergate, folks. They got the little guys and they gave them really stiff sentences and they sang like canaries. They found the tapes and uh, it was, you know, justice was pursued. I think Obama's got an awful lot on his plate. Uh, I tend to be a little bit more uh, patient uh, with him and in uh, thinking that he's got, you know, the economy, he's got the global warming, he's got uh, all kinds of stuff to deal with. Health care is, is a big one. And so he's trying to, trying to keep uh, a lot of balls in, in the air and can be forgiven for not taking on this thing right away. But I think what he also needs is lots of pressure from us. And, you know, he's pretty much said that. You know, he's quoted FDR by saying, make me do it, you know? And the final thing I'll say on this is that uh, I was reading just the other day with uh, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, a one-on-one -on -one with uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson. And as he leaves, uh, LBJ puts his arm around Martin Luther King and says, now, you go out there, you go out there and fight just as hard as you are and make it possible for me to do the right thing. Now. That's what we got to do, folks. That's what we got to do. And uh, let me <laughs> let me read from the the prophet Daniel Berrigan here because I think it points up the the, the situation we're in. Uh, he wrote this uh, during the Vietnam War. He says we have assumed the name of peacemakers or anti-torture people, one might say, uh, but we have been by and large unwilling to pay any significant price. And because we want peace with half a heart, half a life, half a will, the war, of course, continues. Because the waging of war, by its very nature, is total. But the waging of peace, by our own cowardice, is partial. So a whole will and a whole heart and a whole national life bent toward war prevail over the deities of peace. Of course, let us have peace, we cry. But at the same time, let us have normalcy. Let us lose nothing. L let our lives stand intact. Let us know neither prison, nor ill repute, nor disruption of ties. There is no peace because there are no peacemakers. There are no makers of peace because the making of peace is at least as costly as the making of war at least as exigent, at least as disruptive, at least as liable to bring disgrace and prison and even death in its wake. I think we're at that point, folks, where we have to summon the courage to do the right thing, whether it's to stop a war or to stop torture. And I would appeal for you, appeal for you to get together with a small group of trusted friends. This is what we suggest. This is the ethos of the Church of the Savior. Five, six, no more than six. Make sure that there's at least one woman in this circle. It's the women that have the guts, it seems to me, and the insight to be prophets in this kind of milieu. Okay, you meet with them regularly every week and you will be surprised what wisdom comes out of that sharing. Uh, you will be enlightened, inspired uh, to do things that none of you would have thought of uh, individually. And not only that, but when you decide what you're going to do, then there's a community to hold you accountable and to make sure that you do something sensible. Uh, that's where it starts, folks. Margaret Mead was right. Mar Margaret Mead was right. A small group has always been how it starts. And so I'd recommend that to you. Uh, it's worked for us at the Church of the Savior. I think it could work for any little group that wants to pursue justice and has uh, wants to pray for the for the courage to do so
very much.